Hey, good morning, David Julin here, pastor at First Baptist Cramerton, bringing you our sermon this morning. So let's begin as we uh, always do with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you that you have appeared into this world and given us the power to resist sin, not through our own knowledge or ability, but through your mercy and grace and our receiving it. And we pray now in Christ's name. Amen. Scripture text today is from the book of Titus. Now, Titus is uh, a book that's not, I find, and not preached from that often. Um, it's a little small book there in comparison to many others like Romans and Hebrews. If you want to find it, you go to First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and then you have Titus hooked right in there and right before Philemon and then you get Hebrews, this large book. Titus was, I think, one of Paul's troubleshooters. He was, you might call him a troubleshooter. He was a, a person apparently who was a Gentile who became a Christian who became a very dominant leader, a very important leader in the early church. He uh, was one that Paul sent when, when I said a troubleshooter, when there seemed to be difficulties. For example, in Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a very influential, very gifted church with people who could speak and preach and use their spiritual gifts, but also it had a lot of you know, conflicting opinions about things. And Paul is constantly writing and trying to get them back on the right path. And he sends Timothy, Paul sends Timothy, and apparently Timothy is not able to remedy the situation. And then he sends a very severe letter later, he says, that he wants Paul to, uh, he wants the, the church to, to listen to. And he's very concerned that they may just go off in a different direction. But he sends it in Titus's hands. And Titus takes it, and apparently Titus is able to navigate the church through and they accept Paul's teachings in this letter we don't have. And Paul is so excited. He then sends Titus to Crete, which is one of the largest of the Greek islands, and there Titus uh, finds, the, he becomes the, what, the bishop or the leader of the church, the Christian church on that island, which was a wild and woolly place, a Cretan, uh, somebody who uh, might be a person who was a barbarian or a person who, uh, with little morals, and Paul sends Titus in to take care of that. So we find this very influential, very significant person, Titus. And Titus, Paul writes to Titus, he says in chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem for us, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now, in the preceding verses, Paul is giving instructions about how people should behave. Telling Titus, here's instructions about older people. Here's instructions about older men, older women, younger men, younger women, and even slaves. So what he is really trying to teach is by the lifestyle that these Christians live, they are going to be able to witness to the world down there in Crete. Certainly it's important to preach and to teach, but also how they live apparently is important. Even slaves. Now slavery of course has been a shame and an embarrassment to, uh, our, to us for so long as Christians. But one of the things I just want to say, while not trying to excuse uh, how long so many Christians abided with slavery, is that the idea that slaves 
were equal to masters in Christ begin to undercut the idea that people are born slaves, are born less, are born into the status of their life. And over time, the idea that they're created in God's image, uh, that they're in Christ, there's no slave nor free, there is no male nor female, Jew or Gentile. This idea that people are equal began to undercut, uh, to like took an ax to the idea that people are just deserved to be slaves. So we need to be mindful of that, even as we are mindful of how far the church fell short, especially in the United States. Uh, this next pat, this next text, I think, is important. It goes right along with that, where it says. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, to all people. And all people means all people, apparently. Apparently, God wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to be, to have the experience of salvation. So, I have friends, you know, and, and sometimes they're saying, well, this text actually means this, you know, this is what it says. And then I'll say, well, what about this? All, all. It means God wants all people to be saved. And we sort of go back and forth a little bit on that. But I think all is clear. God wants all people to be saved. So no matter where you are, no matter who you encounter, I think the Bible teaches that you can say God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be saved. And our lives and how we experience things and how we respond to things are witnesses to our faith, to do good. Now, in this context, Paul then says in the NIV version, say no to ungodliness. Say no to ungodliness. And it reminded me of a, of a statement I heard uh, some time ago. No is a complete sentence. No is a complete sentence. Apparently, uh, it originated with the uh, writer Anne Lamont, who's a Christian, a very um, uh, unusual Christian, I will say, in the least. But she said this sentence about no being a complete sentence. And there are lots of books and articles about that today. I think one of the things it's trying to say is that we need to protect the boundaries that we have. That sometimes no is enough. Sometimes no is enough. Sometimes so many of us are made to feel that we, we have to do things and we have to respond to things and we have to be a part of things that we feel like are sort of overcoming us. And what this saying reminds us is sometimes saying no is enough. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not say, well, I just can't do it. Uh, I don't have the resources, I don't choose to do that. But sometimes saying no is enough. Parents constantly say no to their children as they grow up. Sometimes when I've been counseling young people, they have to say no to their parents. Our parents have to say no to young people who are adults and say, no, I can't do that. Uh, this is harder than it seems, I realize that. And Listen, sometimes I've found people that are empowered by the word no. All of a sudden they say, no, I, no, I, I'm sorry, no. And then it feels a little better. No. And then no, no, and then no, 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 no. It's like, it's like they're able to just say no, no, no. And I, I will say this as a caution. Of course, the Christian faith is one that is not one about greediness, about I'm the only be concerned about myself, where if somebody asks you for a coat, Jesus says, give them your shirt also, bear one another's burdens. Romans, each one should please our neighbors to build them up, to bear up with the failings of the weak. So there's that that's also this balance in our Christian faith. So we have to navigate this. How do we do this? I think one of the most important things is we have to decide what is important for us who we want to be in life. How are we going to be remembered? What is important to us? Then I think we have to move on to no being how we say no to sin and ungodliness and worldliness. 
No often means not no, but no, but I'm going to find a way out to try to fall into this temptation and sin. I say no, but then we say, oh, maybe it's not so bad. Oh, everybody does it. If this person has done that to me, I would have never done it. Um, those kind of things. But what I think Paul is trying to say here is no is a hard no. A hard no. And a commitment to no. There is a way out of temptation. But what the Christian is to do is to not fall into the temptation that entices us to sin. But we also remember what Paul says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10. That God will provide a way out of the temptation so you can endure it. God will provide a way out. Now what we want that to be is God will provide an easy way out. I know that's how it's been in my life. God will provide an easy way out. But he doesn't say that anywhere, that God will provide an easy way out. Um, a hard no. Sometimes we have to deal with that with, with, with the promises that we make. Forsaking all others. Forsaking all others. As long as we both shall live. Richer or poorer. Better or worse. As long as we both shall live. No means no. No means no. Now, I'm not trying to make people feel bad. I have counseled people in toxic relationships, destructive relationships to divorce. But the next time you're coming into that, remember the importance of our covenant and our commitments. How can we say no to the world? I think one other thing that we don't often use and don't often think about is worship. Worship can help us say no to the world. Um, Paul, in, excuse me, in the Psalms, uh, the psalmist says that God, Psalm 50, is speaking and he says, um, I bring no charges concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I, Psalm 59, I have no need of a bull from your stall or a goat from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I do not eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. These are the intricate, important ingredients of worship in that time. And God says, I don't need those. I don't need those. He may be pleased when we do that properly, I think is what he's saying. But God has no need. There's nothing that God lacks. Okay? There's nothing that God lacks. It may please him by worship, but he doesn't need it in that he lacks something. God does not need our worship songs, but we need to sing them. God does not need our offerings, but we need to give them. God does not need our worship, but we need to show up and be in community as people of faith on a journey. God does not need our songs. We need to sing them. God helps us through worship. He helps us through worship. Remember, it's okay to say no when you're unable to do what you really need to do and you're doing everything really halfway. It's okay to say no. You need to say no to sin and ungodliness, not no but. And finally, the resource that we often neglect is not, as, as Christians, is not just uh, um, stealing up our self, our will, and our, you know, our, our individual ability. It's going into worship and community and singing and being together with others who can help, who can help us bear our burdens through also through worship because it empowers us and strengthens us. Lord, help us. Help us to say no to ungodliness. Help us to be able to say no to things that take us away from being who we are to be. 
And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who desires for all of us to be in relationship to him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Listen, God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful week.